We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on the application layer. I think once you, is it still? Yeah, it keeps going until I get back to this oh, page here. Gosh, that's so unfortunate. All right, application layer. What are we talking about? Well, from a networking perspective, we're really talking about the top three layers, right? Even though session and presentation are unique layers in the, uh, with themselves, the application layer is really everything above layer four, all right? Technically, it's layer seven, but uh, and session and presentation are independent layers. But again, we don't really care too much about those individual layers, all right? These are some common applications. Uh, most likely, you're going to get questions about these applications on the test. These are applications that I'm sure you guys are familiar with. You've seen them many, many times. DNS, used to resolve internet names to IP addresses, uses TCP and UDP port 53. Telnet, used to transport data, right? Or not transport data. Telnet is used to um, uh, uh, remotely access a host or a device. Bootstrap protocol. Now, a lot of people aren't, aren't familiar with the bootstrap protocol. Right here. A lot of people are not familiar with the bootstrap protocol, um, but they are familiar with what it's included in, which is DHCP. DHCP actually uses BootP as its primary method of uh, establishing uh, the transport of DHCP information. UDP port 67, and UDP port 68, okay? We're gonna see more about DHCP in this chapter here. All right, DHCP, the dynamic host control protocol is used to assign IP addresses, subnet masks, gateways to a host. FTP is a file transfer protocol. It's connection oriented because it's TCP based. Whereas TFTP, which is also a file transfer protocol, is connectionless because it uses UDP. FTP, of course, has authentication. TFTP does not typically have authentication. All right, so DNS, resolving human legible names to a numeric network device address by using some sort of domain name service resolution. Now this class, and certainly the test, is not going to get into a whole lot of uh, communication or, or discussion about DNS. Just it's just important that you understand generally what it does, and I think everybody here does. All right. But let's spend a little bit more time and talk about DHCP. Very important. DHCP allows a host to obtain IP address information automatically over the network. There's a four-step process to facilitate a DHCP request. And we're going to kind of go through that four-step process here in a little bit. A client wants to gain access to the network but doesn't have an address assigned. It's going to send out a DHCP discover message so that it can obtain a lease a lease of IP information, IP address, subnet mask, gateway, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I think everybody here and everybody online probably understands the general concept of DHCP, uh, especially if you're involved in networking at all, because it's really used every single day. But there are some nuances about DHCP that you may not be familiar with. For example, DHCP does not go through a router. Why does DHCP not go through a router? What is the characteristic of DHCP that prevents it from being passed through a router? It's broadcast based. And routers do not forward broadcasts. So that actually poses a bit of a problem for us because certainly we want to be able to run DHCP across our entire enterprise, but we don't necessarily want to have to have a separate DHCP server 
on every single segment in our network, which basically is what we would have to do if we didn't have another component in DHCP that we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides. DHCP is broadcast based. It's going to assign things like an IP address, a subnet mask, a default gateway. It'll give you DNS server address information. It's going to give you uh, TFTP information, specific uh, option information, and so on. There are lots and lots and lots of things that DHCP will provide to end devices that are requesting DHCP information. Okay. All right. There are three types of DHCP available. What we call dynamic allocation, which is the most common form, right? Dynamic DHCP allocation. Your computer okay over here? No, no, I was just looking at the news. Oh, okay. All right. Does it have heating problems? Is that uh, Yeah, for some reason, yesterday afternoon and today, it was shut down on its own uh -oh. because it's getting warm. Uh, maybe the table will surface or something. Dynamic allocation. DHCP, this is the one we're talking about here. Uh, let me get my pen out. Dynamic allocation. Uh, DHCP dynamically assigns or uh, an address or a lease for a period of time from an address pool. That address pool is generally called a DHCP address scope, okay, for a limited period of time. That period of time is chosen by the server until the client no longer needs the address. Now, if the client lease time expires, if the client's lease time expires, the client can then renew that address, but they would have to go back to the server and request a renewal. It's very much like any kind of lease, right? You lease a car for three years, at the end of that lease period, you can go ahead and release the car or you can uh, release the car, right? Get it? Uh, okay. This is the most common form, dynamic. Automatic allocation. Now, this is interesting because it's pretty much the same thing as dynamic. But in automatic allocation, there's no lease period. So this is what most of your ISPs are doing for your home routers these days. They're going to assign you a IPv4 address from a pool, but they're not going to require you to renew that lease. They're going to say, okay, well, you go ahead and keep this address for however long you need it. Okay. Manual allocation is where you essentially identify within the scope MAC address X, when it does a request, is going to get IP X. So you've actually set up a policy that says, okay, this particular client is going to get this address. We do that a lot with servers. If you want your servers in your network to always get the same address, you're going to use that methodology. All right. So here's that four step process that I was talking about. D, which is the discover. This is a broadcast. Basically, it's a, a host that goes out and says, hey, I need address information. Is there anybody out there in the world that can provide me address information? The O is the offer. This is the server saying, okay, I have this to offer you, this IP, this mask, this gateway, etc." The request, R, is the client going back to the server and saying, Check, I want what you have to offer. Can you please officially assign that to me? 
and A is the final acknowledgement saying, go ahead and start using that address. They call this the DORA process. Broadcast. It's all broadcast based. And by the way, it's exactly the same, excuse me, in IPv6. The only difference in IPv6 is that it's not broadcast based. It's unicast. Actually multicast, I should say, sorry. D-O-R-A, DORA. Now, as I mentioned before, the problem with this process is that it is uh, broadcast-based. So it does not work through routers, not by default. We're going to talk about how we can get around that in a minute. Okay. In fact, we're going to talk about it right now. You guys have probably seen this command. I'm sure you've seen this command in some of your configurations that you're pasting in called the IP helper address. Here's how it works. This is the client network. This is my server on some subnet. Uh, it doesn't have to be attached to this router. It could be a subnet anywhere in the world. Okay. Of course, the DHCP discover is going to come this way. And if I didn't have helper, that DHCP discover would stop at that interface. But by specifying IP helper address, I'm actually configuring this router as a DHCP proxy. So what the router is going to do is it's going to take that DHCP discover and it's going to convert it to a unicast packet to this IP address. And it's going to relay that request over to the server as a unicast packet, not broadcast. The server is then going to respond to that relay. And then the router will then send the offer to the client. The client has no idea that this process is taking place. The client simply thinks there's a DHCP server on the subnet that is servicing that network. So you can have multiple scopes in this server for all the subnets in your enterprise. And the, the helper address is, is just the, the address of, of, of where the, um, the request should go to. That's right. Yep. And then the DHCP server sees where the request comes from, which comes from this interface, which has this IP address. So it knows to pull an address from a specific pool <coughs> that matches that subnet, and it will send that offer to the router. The router will then send that offer to the client. So if this router had multiple interfaces, doop, 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 we would have helper on each of those interfaces and all of them would point to this server and then the server would respond, okay? Which means we can have one or maybe two DHCP servers for our entire enterprise and those servers can be anywhere as long as they're reachable by the router. Make sense? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. You can also configure a router directly as a DHCP server.
Okay. And the way we do that is we create a pool, right? We create a DHCP pool on the router. We give that pool a name, in this case, M-A-T-T-M-A-A-T-I. We have the starting address, or actually the network for the pool, not the starting address, but the actual network. A default router, DNS information. We have exclusions here as well. Remember, there may be some addresses that you want to exclude from that pool, right? Those might be addresses assigned to network devices or servers or whatever, and that exclusion is a range. So we're excluding, uh, in this case, 10.0.0.1 through 10.0.0.10, okay? And IP helper can even point to a router as well. IP helper does not have to point to a server. It can point to a router. All right. 